Welcome to Tech News of the Week with your host, that third Mario brother that nobody ever talks about. Welcome to Tim Tam's Now on the Way. <laughs> this is our weekly tech news podcast where Chris and I talk for about 10 minutes about four stories that caught our eye. Chris, you took the brunt of punishment by writing the main this week, so I'll jump right in and talk about my first story. Weaveworks winds to a close. In a surprise LinkedIn post, CEO of Weaveworks, Alexis Richardson, announced on Monday, February 5th, that the company would be calling it quits, effective immediately. Weaveworks is best known for their open-source project Flux and the promotion of GitOps and CD workflows. Like many tech startups in the cloud-native scene, Weaveworks had difficulty converting the success of their projects and initiatives into actual money. Alexis said that while they were turning over $10 million in revenue for 2023, their sales growth was, quote, lumpy, leading to a volatile cash position. Ultimately, the organization needed a partner to invest in their long-term growth, and after a promising deal fell through in the 11th hour, they were left with no choice but to shutter the doors. Comments have rolled in fast and, well, not furious, but rather sympathetic and supportive. It's evident from the over 500 comments on the original LinkedIn post that Weaveworks as an organization and its members as people were well-liked and appreciated in the community. Just not enough to, you know, financially support them, I guess. Stupid capitalism being stupid. This is why we can't have nice things, Chris. I sincerely hope the Weaveworks team goes on to create new startups that continue to innovate and push in the tech world. And thank you to Alexis and his compatriots for all their contributions to the DevOps community. Is it just me or is calling sales growth lumpy just an uncomfortable statement? I feel the same way about that as I feel about the word moist. (laughs) You're welcome. Report reveals decline in quality of USB sticks and micro SD cards. Hmm. (laughs) So it's not often that the headline I read out is literally the headline of the article. But here (laughs) we are incredulously. My first thought was, did anybody ever think that USB sticks actually had quality Hmm. to speak of? They certainly never had quality control. In my experience, USB sticks came in two kinds. One, able to survive washing machines, x-ray scanners, absurd temperatures, and probably the apocalypse. And two, unable to survive past lunch. (laughs) Well, I guess the population of category one is about to take a hit. A report by CBL shows that NAND chips from companies like Hynix, SanDisk, and Samsung were being used in USB sticks even though those NAND chips had failed lab testing. This included both garbage sticks that are given away at trade shows and the garbage sticks that are being sold at Best Buy and other places. Mm. Not a shot at Best Buy, just the first name I could think of. Please don't sue me. My favorite part of the article is where they breathlessly reported things like, quote, a micro SD card found inside a USB stick. (gasps) As though this was some kind of new development. Spoiler alert, it isn't. No. Anyway, even though there are still good USB sticks out there, you can tell the ones that are good because they're the ones that are expensive. USB sticks cannot and should not be considered reliable and at the very least should always be backed up. And seriously, just use the frigging cloud, people. That thing is everywhere. How am I going to boot my ESXi server now? Uh, Moving on. Cached pages on Google search are gone. Advertising company Google has been phasing out cached pages on Google search for a while now. But you could still access them if you knew where to look. Hint, you could add a cache parameter string to the search URL. But alas... In a Twitter post, search liaison Danny Sullivan let everyone know that the cached page feature was headed for the Google graveyard. He went on to explain that the cached feature was from an era when websites were unreliable and would often go down or become overwhelmed. The cache option was a workaround to view the page as it was when last crawled by the Google web crawler. 
But now it's the future and websites, they never go down, right? Right? And certainly, no one ever tries to remove things from a website to hide their stupid decisions, right? That's, that's definitely not a thing. In the same Twitter thread, Danny pontificated about adding links to the Internet Archive as a possible replacement to the cache option, while clarifying that this idea was his own idea and not a Google initiative. That's pretty rich, considering Google is a trillion-dollar market cap company, and the Internet Archive is, um, well, it ain't that for certain. One of these days, we'll have to do a whole episode on how the Google search experience has become demonstrably worse over the last decade. This is simply a symptom of a much larger problem. Of course, Google has bigger things to worry about right now, like the existential threat of AI, which is definitely not a code red, except it very much is. When toothbrushes attack. Don't put everything on the internet. Volume 867. Now stop me if your pressure cooker has heard this one before. IoT device, which has internet connectivity for reasons no sane person can explain, is used in massive attack that causes millions of dollars in damages. Hmm. That's right. It happened again. <laughs> and if you were listening to me read the headline, you know that the IoT device in question is a toothbrush. Uh-huh. Sorry, a smart toothbrush. This week, a report from Fortinet Labs came out in Sweden, and in Swedish or German or whatever it is, they Dutch, I don't know, <laughs> a different language, that showed 3 million smart toothbrushes were part of a DDoS botnet used to attack a Swiss company. The story is light on details, but the sort of thing has happened enough that we know full well what happened. Mm-hmm idiotic product was rushed to market by lowest common denominator manufacturer. The product had questionable utility, but pretty graphs, <laughs> and an insecure and not updated operating system. Mm -hmm. In this case, Fortinet said it was Java-based, which is not better. <laughs> no. This was then put online, where it was instantly compromised, chaos ensues. I rush to remind you, this was a toothbrush. Mm -hmm. If it had to be connected to anything. It should have been connected by Bluetooth to a poorly written Java app on your phone. Mm -hmm. At least then the phone would have helped with security. And for the millionth time, I beg manufacturers to stop producing this insecure trash and consumers to stop buying it. You wouldn't download a car, but you can be sure your toothbrush has no qualms about downloading a botnet. Talk about hygiene problems. But I'm... Um, at least, that's how the story would have ended, if it wasn't for the fact that the story is actually bullshit. Oh. I know. Follow-up reporting shows that this botnet situation wasn't real. Oh. According to Fortinet Labs, it was, quote, purely hypothetical. Now, this was a particularly galling revelation, considering Fortinet let the story sit out there for over a week before issuing this clarification. Oh, and their stock got a 5% bump, which was interesting. Weird. Upon learning the truth of the matter just this morning, I choose to leave the bluster and hyperbole above unedited as a little bit of a lesson. Well, two lessons. All right. One, although this particular botnet didn't happen, it totally could have and has happened before. Yeah. IoT has a long way to go before security can be just assumed. And two, it is a healthy reminder to trust but verify, right? The original story was a tad outlandish. It was just a little too pat, right? <laughs> Enough that literally everyone involved should have confirmed things before going to print. And by that, I mean Tech Radar. I mean Tom's Hardware. I mean, I could go on. You can. There were more I've forgotten. But anyway, confirming things before printing, that's, just, that's the journalistically responsible thing to do. And really, where's the fun in that? Boring. Listen, retractions are easy. Paying editors and fact checkers? That's expensive. 
I believe it was Confucius that said, the truth is for nerds. <laughs> All right, that's it. We're done. Bye, everyone. Bye.